Welcome to Cartoonists Take Up Smoking. I'm Dr. Alan Blum, and this exhibition really dates to my childhood. I, I love newspapers, and growing up in New York, there were 10 dailies. Uh, some days, especially on Saturdays, I would get them all to read different sports writers' take on the Dodger games the night before. The Daily News, the Daily Mirror, the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, the New York Post, the Journal American in the afternoon, and the World Telegram and Sun. Of course, it was the Wall Street Journal, and on Long Island, where I was, Newsday and the Long Island Press. Saturday nights, I would go with my dad. Uh, our ritual was around 8.30 or 9 o'clock Saturday night to drive to Far Rockaway to go to the curbside newsstand in front of the drugstore where one of his patients uh, had uh, a stack of the Sunday morning papers, which we were buying on Saturday night. He'd stop for a slice of pizza or an ice cream, and I would go home and just spend half the night reading all the papers that we'd gotten. On uh, weeknights, uh, I'd go with him at 5.30 to get the Long Island Railroad train to pick up the World Telegram and Sun with the closing markets. My favorite feature in all of these was the editorial cartoons of Willard Mullen of the New York Journal American, sports cartoons. They occupied nearly an entire page, and they had the original bum of the Brooklyn Dodgers as the figure that everyone would recognize from Brooklyn. By the high school years, I had become a cartoonist for my high school newspaper, the Woodmere Academy Echo, and I was even able to give a talk on editorial cartooning at the Columbia Scholastic Press Conference in 1965. I just wasn't very good. By the time I became an anti-smoking activist in the late 1970s during my residency at the University of Miami School of Medicine in Miami, I was a, a fan of the cartoons of uh, Jim Morin of the Miami Herald and uh, Don Shoemaker of the Miami News. And uh, they weren't necessarily uh, anti-smoking as I was, but I began collecting and saving their cartoons. I also had grown up with a big love of Mad Magazine. And by the 1980s, when I became editor of the New York State Journal of Medicine and moved back to New York, I wondered why Mad hadn't been running those great parodies of cigarette ads that they had in the 50s and 60s. So naively, I called up Al Feldstein, the editor of Mad Magazine, and he said, why don't you come in and talk to me and Bill Gaines? It was quite a thrill because I sat there, uh, having been, as a boy, their, their probably number one fan, trying to convince them to bring back some of these great satires, which they did. By 1983, as editor of the New York State, as by 1982, as, as editor of the Medical Journal of Australia, I had the idea to do a theme issue on the world tobacco pandemic and wanted to do something different. One of my favorite editorial cartoonists by that point was uh, Wayne Stasekel at the Chicago Tribune. And again, out of the blue, I called him to see whether he might like to do the cover for the Medical Journal of Australia. I had in mind a uh, concept of a, a couple walking down the street and uh, seeing a whole bunch of billboards, and behind one of them was a couple of little kids smoking cigarettes and having the one of the couples say to the other, gee, you can try to keep kids from smoking, but peer pressure is simply too great. He turned that into a wonderful editorial cartoon, which we ran on the March 5th, 1983 cover of the first theme issue in the world, the Medical Journal of Australia's theme issue on the world cigarette pandemic. Later that year, back in New York, as editor of the New York State Journal of Medicine, I produced a second theme issue and commissioned Wayne to do a, a cartoon of the Statue of Liberty holding up a cigarette lighter and lighting up a big pack of Marlboros under her arm. Wayne and I continued to correspond, and uh, I think he's the cartoonist that did more uh, cartoons on smoking than any other one, over 80, that uh, I was able to acquire from him between his years at the Chicago Tribune and the Tampa Tribune. The very first editorial cartoon I acquired was that of Dennis Drawn, who was working at the Scranton Times. I had gone there to interview Father Thomas Garrett, who was an interesting individual, a, a priest and a, a teacher at the University of Scranton. He was an expert on business ethics and the ethics of advertising. And I'd seen him in a 1964 CBS reports commenting on the ethics of cigarette advertising just after the Surgeon General's report came out. Why not try to track him down? And I did, and he graciously consented to a meeting at his home. He'd since left the priesthood, 
was continuing to teach there at the University of Scranton and was married to a former nurse who also taught there, and she had been a nun. On my way out of town, I picked up the local paper, as I always did, and lo and behold, that very day, Dennis Drawn had an editorial cartoon about smoking, a ticking time bomb. I contacted him, and he agreed to let me acquire his cartoon, the very first one for what would ultimately be the exhibition. Through the 1990s, I would return to New York and uh, from Houston, where I was at Baylor College of Medicine, and the first place I'd go would be Hodling's Out of Town Newsstand to check as many newspapers as I could to uh, purchase them if they had an editorial cartoon about smoking. I didn't know where this was leading, uh, but um, in the back of my mind was the possibility of putting these together in some kind of exhibition. I had done one on health claims in cigarette advertising, 1888 to 1988, at the Texas Medical Center Library, which consisted of old cigarette ads more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, and a sordid variety of these over-the-top ads over the last hundred years. I began uh, finding out what it took to be an editorial cartoonist and uh, perhaps uh, whether there was an organization. And sure enough, I joined the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists as a lay member. And as I corresponded with folks um, and went to the cartoon art festivals at uh, Ohio State University hosted by Lucy Caswell, I began to meet cartoonists. Among the first was Ted Rall, and it was Matt Bores, and uh, the AEC invited me to give a talk on the subject of smoking and editorial cartoons in 2001 in Toronto, where the other speakers included uh, Ralph Nader. Um, the the out-of-town newsstands were fewer and farther between as the internet came in, but in Houston there was the super stand where every week I would check the 20 or 30 papers that would come in from all over the country. And then in Atlanta, uh, Joe Muggs. Uh, by this point, we had moved to the University of Alabama, and I would drive to Atlanta every now and then just to check out what newspapers might have editorial cartoons on smoking. At the AAC meetings, I ran into Draper Hill of the Detroit News, who educated me more about the history of uh, political cartoons, beginning really with um, William Hogarth, uh, the 18th century satirist who did the famous Gin Lane portraits of uh, the, the adverse effects of drinking gin. And the British artist James Gilray, who in the uh, late 18th century and early 19th century uh, did caricatures of uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, figures and uh, did illustrations for Dickens. James uh, George Cruikshank, uh, the, who did anti-alcohol and anti-smoking cartoons in the 19th century. And he reminded me that Benjamin Franklin in the United States had perhaps made the earliest editorial cartoon, his famous snake being cut to pieces, join or die. Thomas Nast, who in the Civil War era was America's leading uh, cartoonist in Harper's Weekly and did some tremendous satires on Boss Tweed in New York and also uh, had a few that satirized uh, tobacco. In the 20th century, uh, her block, was one of the ones that I grew up with in the 60s and 70s, syndicated in over 300 newspapers from the Washington Post, Bill Malden, Paul Conrad from the Los Angeles Times, Malden in the Chicago Sun-Times, Jeff McNelly, and a few others. But by the time I did that talk in 2001, I'd met a few cartoonists and determined to put together an exhibition. I talked to Milt Priggy, who was at the Spokane review and was one of the first to leave there and to become syndicated. Perhaps he saw the writing on the wall for the future of editorial cartooning. Ed Stein at the Rocky Mountain News took me under his wing and introduced me to other cartoonists. Terry Mosher, who I've never met in person, but who for many years worked under the name Aislan at the Montreal Star and then the Montreal Gazette, was very, very helpful in introducing me to Canadian cartoonists. Clyde Peterson, or C.P. Houston, the editorial cartoonist for the Houston Chronicle, was very helpful. Bill Dior at the Dallas Times Herald and Ben Sargent at the Austin Statesman also lent a hand. There were conservative cartoonists that were among the most helpful to me. Chuck Eze at the Colorado uh, Gazette and uh, Michael Ramirez, who went from the Memphis paper where I met him to the LA Times. Jim Lang, one of the most remarkable individuals who did 
uh, daily and weekend cartoons for the, the Oklahoman and Oklahoma City for over 50 years. Gary Varville, who realized his childhood dream growing up in Indianapolis of becoming the Indianapolis Stars editorial cartoons. In Alabama, uh, to which we moved in, uh, to th in uh, 1999, J.D. Crow of the Mobile Register and Scott Stantis, then with the Birmingham News, were very, very helpful as was Charles Brooks, who was the dean of Alabama editorial cartoonists and uh, had been years before at the Birmingham News. Craig Bennett was also in Alabama and he moved on to the Christian Science Monitor. Um, in, in nationally, as I began realizing that Daryl Cagle, a remarkable individual, had begun coordinating uh, the sale and distribution of many of the great cartoonists around the country, uh, his Kegel cartoons and his colleague Brian Fear were tremendously helpful in, in uh, uh, letting me have access to other cartoonist works. Um, I could just name them for, forever, but um, uh, David Horsey in Washington and Paul Fell in Nebraska, Andy Donato in Toronto and Matt Worker in Washington were all instrumental in getting this particular exhibition going. There are a couple of great stories. Uh, David Fitzsimmons in Arizona, uh, practically in tears, talking to me about what smoking did to his parents and writing a statement that we included in our very first exhibition, which debuted at the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists Convention in 2004 in Lexington, Kentucky, ironically the very day that the state passed its first clean and air ordinance. Sean Delonis was the cartoonist at the New York Post, the very far right leaning Murdoch-owned newspaper, but he had a wicked sense of humor that parodied a lot of the anti-smoking movement. I thought his work was, was pretty hilarious, though, and uh, when I contacted him to see if he would participate, he told me that I was really the first one to ever ask uh, to reprint his editorial cartoons. By 2004, though, we had, uh, I had interacted with uh, over 100 of the nation's editorial cartoonists, and uh, the exhibition debuted and I began getting asked to see if we could take it elsewhere. Paul Fell brought it to the rotunda at the university, uh, at the, uh, brought it to the rotunda of the state capital of Nebraska. We had it in uh, Seattle at an art gallery brought by Roger Valdez, who is the director of the city's smoking, anti-smoking program. He did it because uh, the tobacco companies were sponsoring artists and, and musicians and having concerts. So he wanted a way to show that the uh, anti-smoking movement could sponsor activities as well, such as parroting the tobacco industry. We took this to the National Conference on Smoking and Health in Minneapolis in 2007, and we opened in Alabama at both the university's Museum of Natural History in Tuscaloosa, as well as UAB at Birmingham. We were in Buffalo, New York at the University of Buffalo, and we had a year-long exhibition at the National Museum of health and medicine that was twice extended because the curator, Adrian Noe, wanted, uh, the director wanted to have this seen by more and more school children. This was in effect uh, an exhibition that uh, took over 10 years to plan and, and create. We're now revising and updating it and digitizing it for the first time and releasing this in 2022. And again, I couldn't have done this without uh, the extraordinary assistance of Kevin Bailey, our web designer and collection manager from 2018 to 2022, as well as uh, our longtime uh, collection manager in the early 2000s, Lori Jacoby. And perhaps most of all, I'd like to thank Doris Bunn, my wife, for having helped me cope, for having coped with me all these years as we tried to put together this exhibition.